The region of South Asia has a population of over 1.7 billion people as of the year 2017, about one-fourth of all humans on the planet, and almost 30 times larger than the country of the United Kingdom today. And as most people know, the British were the main European influence in the subcontinent for hundreds of years, and it is rather incredible to think that such a small Sorry. country could have such a huge impact on this sprawling region made up of a plethora of different religions, cultures, and languages. The British rule in the area of the former British Raj, that being Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan, are looked upon with varying emotions by different people, but it's undeniable how they've changed many aspects of modern South Asian culture, with the most notable contribution most likely being the growing usage of the English language in the region, and many might think that their legacy ends at that. However, there is a large community of people in India that do still have a connection to Britain, and by extension the former British colonial rulers in South Asia. The British rule and incorporation of India was initially a rather slow process starting in the 1600s after the establishment of the British East India Company, an independently funded company originally interested in facilitating international trade in lieu of the defeat of the Spanish by England. The East India Company, or simply the company as it was referred to, established or occupied ports on the coast and at first very rarely ventured into the interior of the continent, mostly desiring spices from the locals, although they were not, however, the first European power to have established contact with the Indians, with the Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama reaching India a century earlier, motivated by the closing of the Silk Road by the Ottomans in the 15th century. Contrary to popular belief, the Europeans were not immediately treated with hostility by the natives when arriving in South Asia, and vice versa, with most of the European powers having large qualms with each other rather than the native South Asians, and the Portuguese, Dutch, English, French, and Danish, interestingly enough, all established ports on the coast, eventually venturing further inland along major rivers. These posts were essentially skeleton crews, meaning very few Europeans actually settled there, with many of the workers being hired locally, although they were almost always commanded by a British officer, seeing how the East India Company was independent of the crown and thus had a private army. It's also important to realize that there were two main phases of British colonialism in India, with the first phase having a more hands-off, laissez-faire attitude, as the British government didn't directly oversee East Indian affairs, although the two would later become heavily integrated and the East India Company would be dismantled and absorbed. The first period of British presence in India was actually fairly peaceful aside from the wars with the competing European powers and occasional squabbles with the Mughals, and hence many Englishmen saw this as a ripe opportunity for easy fortune when compared to the Georgian era of Britain, and thousands of able-bodied men were hired by the company. By the year 1800, over a quarter of a million men were employed in the army of the East India Company, making it one of the largest armies and certainly the largest private mm. army in the world at the time, although not all of the men were sent to India, with many others being stationed in Singapore, Malaysia, and East Africa. For context on just how impressive this was, in today's world this would be the equivalent of a privately owned American-based company like Facebook or Google hiring an army of 2.7 million people, about twice that of the United States' current active military personnel, and effectively gradually taking over an entire continent like South America, all the while without direct support from the federal government and having to battle off the militaries of other actual countries not just private corporations. These Britishers, a term used to describe the British used very seldom outside of South Asia, the South Asian diaspora, were overwhelmingly young men as the company mainly employed them as soldiers or sailors and British women were rarely taken to the subcontinent aside from the wives and families of local governors or high-ranking officials. It's important to realize that the British colonization of India was very different from that of the Americas, seeing how the Americas were already very sparsely populated, which was definitely not the case for India, which had been a hub of old world civilization for thousands of years, and deeply connected to the regions of the Middle East and Europe through the Silk Road, granting them exposure to many of the Eurasian diseases which proved detrimental to the native Amerindians of America. It was thus fairly rare for non-military British families to settle in company forts, although it did pick up during the late 1700s with many British officers and governors actually being born in the subcontinent, mainly large coastal cities such as Chennai, Calcutta, and Mumbai. 
During their presence in India from the 1700s to the 1800s, many British soldiers employed by the company would marry native women from India or other Asian countries, with some estimating that up to one-third of British troops married Indians. And although this wasn't necessarily encouraged or discouraged by the company, in some cases even British officers would have an Indian wife, as was the case for Lieutenant Colonel James Achilles Kirkpatrick, an Englishman born in modern Tamil Nadu in South India, who became captivated by Indian culture and was able to learn and speak Persian, Hindi, Tamil, and Telugu fluently and dressed identically to the neighboring Mughals at the time. Kirkpatrick fathered several illegitimate children with various native women during his service in the company, eventually converting to Islam and marrying the granddaughter of the Prime Minister of Hyderabad. The children of Kirkpatrick and other British men employed in India were initially neglected by both the company and the British government, historically being referred to as Eurasian or Indo-Britons, although today they're known as Anglo-Indians, a term which had first been used to refer solely to Englishmen born in India. Although the emerging mixed-race class was generally looked down upon, many Anglo-Indians were able to rise to prominence in the company, such as Colonel James Skinner, whose father was actually an officer of Scottish origin rather than English, which showed that those of mixed race did have the opportunity to rise in rank. Over the two centuries of company rule in India, thousands of interracial marriages or affairs added to their ranks, and although many Anglo-Indians would simply marry into the European community, many still would marry the other half-Indian, half-Europeans, including those with Portuguese, Dutch, French, or other European ancestry. The extremely brutal and bloody Indian Rebellion of 1857 brought about an end to this hands-off style approach by the British government, with the East India Company being abolished and the Crown declaring direct ownership over the subcontinent, now known as the British Raj. The initial attacks on British families and soldiers by the rebels were greatly exaggerated by authorities, and hence the retribution was swift and greatly out of proportion with the British taking no prisoners among the mutineers and this ensuing period was marked by violence, aggression, and distrust on both sides. Interracial marriage was immediately declared illegal in the new British Raj for both European men and women, but tens of thousands of multiracial children had already been born, leading to a rejection of the Anglo-Indians by both the British and Indian societies. Following the ban on interracial marriage in the British Raj, thousands of British women were brought in from Europe to accompany their husbands, and although men still would far outnumber the women, it was now very uncommon for them to take native wives, although the practice did continue on in the surrounding regions under British control, such as Singapore or Hong Kong. There was additionally a much smaller mixed-race population in Burma, now referred to as the Anglo-Burmese, which was also incorporated into the British Raj, and these two communities frequently mingled and formed their own unique identity within British India, being a mix of European, mostly English, French, or Portuguese, and South Asian culture, which could be from literally dozens of sources such as the Tamil, Tulugu, Malayali, Marathi, or Bengali, seeing how the community was so spread out over the region. During the movement for Indian independence, most Anglo-Indians either remained neutral or supportive of the British, and hence after independence, and the rise of South Asian nationalism, many packed their bags and departed with the estimated 200,000 British settlers, although the majority stayed initially and integrated into the new Indian society. In 1946, the British government feared that the Anglo-Indian community would face harsh discrimination or attacks due to their English heritage and proposed an independent country for Anglo-Indians and the Anglo-Burmese in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands which at the time were very sparsely populated, a plan which mirrored proposals from the Dutch to grant Western New Guinea to their mixed-race offspring, the Indos. The plan never came to fruition, and the Anglo-Indians never suffered large-scale attacks in India or Bangladesh, although the Burmese government did heavily discriminate against the Anglo-Burmese community following their independence. The Anglo My apologies, that's the coffee pot. Much alive and kicking, both in South Asia and abroad, with estimates varying greatly for the number that still identify as such in the country of India, with some sources claiming the number is over half a million, while others claim the number has dropped to less than a hundred thousand. Although a median estimate gives an approximation of around 300 to 400,000, although easily over a million Indians may have partial European ancestry, and many might not even know it. Which may sound like a lot, but this is still less than 0.1% of the country's population. 
Around 150,000 or 30 to 50 percent of the community has relocated to Western countries such as the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, the U.S. or New Zealand, while around 50,000 live in other Asian countries formerly administered by the British such as Malaysia and Singapore. Because of the decentralized nature of Anglo-Indian culture in the community, many believe that their people are dying out as many of the youth either move overseas or marry into the native Indian community. Although the Anglo-Indians have received a revitalization of their cultural identity in recent years, seeing themselves as both British and Indian, with the majority practicing Christianity and a small minority practicing either Hinduism or Islam. Because of the diversity of their genome, the appearance of Anglo-Indians greatly varies, with some being able to pass as fully North Indian, South Indian, or European, and despite the small size of their population, they have considerable representation in Bollywood and other forms of South Asian media. Although the British presence in India is now null, their legacy still lives on through the Anglo-Indian community, a truly unique culture that's a fusion of South Asian and European influences, which is especially interesting considering that when comparing a map of Indo-European languages, the English, a German Germanic people group and the Indians are on entirely different ends of the spectrum, giving them a history that is definitely worth learning about. Be sure to let me know your thoughts on the Anglo-Indian community, and if you're an Anglo-Indian yourself living in either India or abroad, I'd especially love to hear your experiences. Oh, and keep your eyes peeled because next time is going to be a classic Mesa Man video that I think you guys are really going to find interesting. As always, thanks for watching everyone, this has been Mason. And I'll see you next time. Um, first of all, let me apologize for things that were happening on my computer. Uh, things were popping up. I apologize for any distraction that may cause. And the coffee pot. <clears throat> very interesting. Very interesting video. Um, something that I assumed was there from the, from the occupation of the British. Uh, I assume that's where a lot of the fair-skinned Indians came from partially right partially wrong um, <clears throat> India is such a um, diverse place it is a place that I am I am looking forward to visiting I have on my phone I got a weather app and and uh, on my weather app I, I, I put different cities I put a city where I used to live where family is uh, Joliet Illinois I have uh, of course uh, Mesa where I live um, I have um, Flagstaff and Cottonwood, places that I go to quite a bit. But in India, I have uh, Vizag. And I'm thinking Vizag, uh, it's 82 degrees right now in Vizag. I think that's going to that's gonna be my landing spot, is Vizag. I've been watching and reading a lot about Vizag. And I would love to hear from somebody who is from Vizag. Um, what's, um, you know, what's it cost for a two-bedroom apartment? Two-bedroom, two-bath. Because I go on conversion tables, and and I can't figure out the conversion quite right, um, because it's not in rupees. Like I can find stuff that says rubies to dollars, but I can't. And I think this is in crows or something. And, and if the calculations are right, I find it hard to believe that a two-bedroom apartment with two bathrooms is three hundred thousand dollars. I don't, I don't know. So, anyways, um, Vizag, please hit me up. Um, I'll catch you guys later. Peace and much love, the professor.